Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Liz Petjohn. Can you all hear me? Yes, great. Um, I am head of department of history of art, and every once in a while I'm also allowed to do research on history of art as well, and so I'm a specialist on Victorian art, and particularly on the art of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, and the next generation, the artists of the aesthetic movement, and uh, the arts and crafts. So um, I'm going to give you just a quick example from some of the work that I do. What I'm going to do is concentrate on one painting, a single work, as an example of the kind of teaching we do and really of our philosophy about the history of art. We believe in close study of works of art for several important reasons. It is crucial to develop your skills in the analysis and interpretation of visual images, whether or not you intend to go on to a career in the art world. If you do want to go on to a career in the art world, which is, of course, highly competitive, you need to be the best trained people in the world in actual visual objects, art objects. But if you decide to do something else, your skills in visual analysis will still be among your greatest assets in the world of employment and the job market. In our world, images are absolutely everywhere, as you all know, look at your computer screens or your phone. Um, the people who are going to be successful in all kinds of careers in the 21st century are the people who are really good at interpreting and using visual images. Now, there are also other reasons for our concentration on the work of art. We think that the combination of visual and intellectual skills gives you the most rigorous education, the finest training for the mind as well as for the eye. And last, but by no means least, we think these works of art are just wonderful. They offer delight to you and us and potentially to audiences all over the world. That's what makes us tick. It's why some of us were a little late. We were looking at a private collection, the collection of Lord Kirkham near Doncaster in South Yorkshire. He's got some amazing stuff. We can tell you about some of it later. Um, it is what makes us get up in the morning and what we hope is going to make the lives of all of our students worthwhile, not only while they're here at York, but for the rest of their lives. Um, and uh, they can take it home to their families as well. So, this is my example, a painting by one of the less well-known members of the Pre-Raphaelite Circle, Frederick Sands, which appeared at the exhibition of the Royal Academy in London in 1869. So that summer exhibition was, is the ancestor of the same exhibitions that are still held every summer at the Royal Academy in this building, Burlington House in Piccadilly, and I'm showing you the building, which I hope um, some of you may have visited. Um, they were holding a Rhoda exhibition and an exhibition on uh, Chola sculpture at the time. This slide was taken, but recently you might, some of you might have gone there to see the Kiefer exhibition, um, Anselm Kiefer exhibition, which has um, just been on. Very exciting exhibition. Now that was displayed in exactly the same rooms in the Royal Academy where this painting by Frederick Sands was exhibited all the way back in 1869, 140-odd years ago. So what should we make of this painting from 1869? Even at first glance, I hope it's obvious that we're dealing with something that's pretty complex. We've got a heroine from ancient Greek mythology, Medea, known from the great play by the dramatist Euripides. But she's represented as a medieval witch mixing a potion and shown with the gold background of a medieval or very early Renaissance painting. Yet in another sense, the picture is also startlingly modern in the immediacy of its very realist style. Greek, medieval, modern, the painting is all of those things at once, as if it sums up all of history. And indeed, there's something uh, interestingly systematic about the way the picture deploys its historical references within its own pictorial space. So I'd like to explore this for the next few minutes, starting in the foreground with the magical ingredients that are lined up on this marble parapet. Here, the precision of detail, 
together with the play of light, establishes an insistent three-dimensionality, and the magic or uncanny character of the objects is expressed visually as a series of weird or irregular shapes. From the left, we have a blue faience figurine, an Egyptian object, the pulpy leaves of a manuscript, um, inscribed with runic characters. I'm not sure you can quite see those in this slide, but um, maybe you can sort of make out some of the runes. Um, and resting on the pages are a spray of deadly nightshade and a pair of copulating toads with their yellow eyes winking at us. Next, we have the desiccated skeleton of a stingray, then an abalone shell with its iridescent interior catching reflections of the flame from the metalwork brazier and containing a red liquid which could be wine or perhaps blood. And above is the strangest shape of all, the glass beaker in the figure's hand, seemingly distorted and twisted in the boat blowing process and translucent so that it glows in the firelight. Its irregular forms contrast with the smooth flesh of the tapering fingers, each with its rosy fingernail. So, we move one plane back to the figure. This is a close in, in imitation of the type of figure invented by Dante Gabriel Rossetti in figures such as the one on the right, Fazio's Mistress a half-length female figure amidst gorgeous accessories. And indeed, Rossetti was worried that Sands was getting too close to his work, and at just about this date, 1869, he accused him of plagiarism. Yet, Rossetti's compositional type was itself an imitation, drawn from such Venetian Renaissance paintings as this one on the right by Giovanni Bellini, the St. Dominic of about 1515. That had entered the collection of the South Kensington Museum, the one we now know as the V&A, in 1856, and it would certainly have been familiar to both Rossetti and Frederick Sands. Rossetti had been using this composition since 1859 with striking results, and Sands certainly borrowed it for his picture, Medea. Um, things like the half-length figure with the shelf or parapet before it, and a decorated backdrop behind. We now tend to see a face like this as simply as a late Pre-Raphaelite beauty. But for contemporary critics, the figure presented a strange combination of beauty and horror, intensified by the weird light effect, the firelight that illuminates the face from below. The figure prompted one contemporary critic to a bizarre comparison. The critic wrote, the artist may have been impressed by the unwanted intensity of expression thrown into the head of Medusa by sculptors of classic epochs and by Da Vinci and Caravaggio in the Middle Ages. Now that, that comparison is quite interesting in several respects. First, it displaces the actual story of the painting, the story of Medea, in favor of the myth of Medusa, a more grotesque story, at least visually. The sight of Medusa had the power to turn observers to stone, and the comparison suggests just how strong the impact of this figure was. Moreover, the comparison to Caravaggio is highly unusual for this day, when Caravaggio's reputation was at its lowest ebb. On the extremely rare occasions when his name comes up at all in Victorian criticism, it's only to deride what is seen as his squalid realism. Nonetheless, the critic's comment is acute. Caravaggio's Medusa does make a compelling comparison to Sands' Medea. Um, interestingly, Sands couldn't have known the work by Caravaggio, except perhaps in reproduction, since he never visited the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, where that work hangs. By whatever occult means, he's managed somehow to recapture something of the intensity of Caravaggio's characterization of the Medusa in his picture of Medea. Like both of the Caravaggio and Rossetti's female figures, Sand's figure starts out of the picture space in vivid three-dimensional materiality. But let's move back into the picture one plane further. 
suddenly we're in a different world, a two-dimensional one, a world of allegory rather than realism with schematic symbols on a flat gold ground. There's still the same preternatural clarity of delineation, but a wholly different style, one that's deliberately hieratic, in stark contrast to the utterly persuasive realism of the foreground area and the figure of Medea herself. The picture is literally a gold back. That's the colloquial name given to religious paintings of the Middle Ages or very early Renaissance that place their figures on a ground of gold leaf. And on the right is an example that entered the National Gallery in 1848 and again would have been familiar to Sands. The picture type strongly associated with religious subject matter as in this example. So in this, in this format, Medea appears as a kind of occult version of a saint or, or of the Virgin Mary. Until now, we've seen very little in the picture that can definitely be associated with the mythological story of Medea. All of the specific references to the myth appear in symbolic form on the gold background. To the left is the ship of Medea's lover Jason, the Argo, floating on stylized waves like curlicues, like a ship in a medieval manuscript. To the right is the golden fleece hanging on a tree. Depiction of the tree, again, um, it's an oak tree, a stylized one. We could call it conceptual, with its enormous acorns and leaves. And underneath are bushes of magic herbs, again, with oversized leaves and flowers. The poet, Algernon Charles Swinburne, a close associate of the Pre-Raphaelite Circle, wrote a review of this painting and identified the bushes as henbane, aconite, and nightshade. Even the names sound like emblems of magic. Just visible in the sky are the constellations. You can just about see them, perhaps. Um, representative signs of the zodiac, so another kind of symbol or allegory. Furthermore, and unexpectedly, a bat wheels before a full moon while white grains um, uh, fly um, over the gold ground. These details seem to be borrowed from Japanese prints, screens, or textiles, objects that were just beginning to enter London and the European art world after the opening of Japan to trade in 1858. Um, now, on a screen that separates the foreground from the background are um, Egyptian symbols in metalwork, scarabs, owls, um, little animal-headed creatures, animal gods of, of Egyptian sort, and in the shallow space between the screen and the figure is a dragon. And you just see him, a strange mediator between the realistic foreground and the schematic background um, uh, in, the, in the painting. You can actually see his claws and foot over here. Um, see how his, his tusk just brushes Medea's shoulder and twines with her hair. Now, what is this dragon? He has been compared to the emaciated, dragon-like devil in Dürer's engraving of 1513, Night, Death, and the Devil. And the work of Gerald was a particular enthusiasm in the Pre-Raphaelite circle. But the dragon's also reminiscent of Japanese examples, such as the drawings of Hokusai's manga. I mean, if you look at the, the tusks here and the scary eyes, I think. Um, again, these were just beginning to percolate into London art circles at this date. So Sen seems to be conflating a pre-Raphaelite visual reference with an Orientalist one. So what are we supposed to make of this complex mixture of imitations and influences? The composition of the painting equates a movement back into history with the movement into pictorial depth. And it moves back not just once, but twice. First, in the leap over the parapet with its uncannily realistic paraphernalia to the figure of Medea, and again beyond the Egyptian roundels and the guardian dragon to the gold back with its two-dimensional allegories. 
Now, the mode of the figural representation might be called a Renaissance type of representation with its volumetric amplitude. But in place of the naturalistic backdrop in paintings like the Bellini that we saw before, Sands moves back again in time to the earlier mode of the gold back, the gold leaf painting. Moreover, it's there that we see traces of the still more ancient myth of which mere schematic outlines survive. So, Sands is preserving the format of the Rossettian picture, the picture type invented by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, in all of its essentials, but he gives it new meaning as a form of historical representation. Interestingly, the critics at the Royal Academy Exhibition of 1869 don't seem to have been able to follow this historical experiment of Sands. They insisted on seeing the figure of Medea in the present tense as if she was mixing their, her potion before their very eyes. But they were unwilling to venture an opinion on the strange, archaic background which none of them mentioned, except for the poet Swinburne, who was prepared to comment on this element. He writes, Upon the golden ground behind is wrought in allegoric decoration the likeness of the ship Argo with other emblems of the tragic things of her life. Now, I think Swinburne's particular words are interesting, allegoric, likeness, emblems, and perhaps most of all, decoration. These are words that it's not usual to find in the discussion of painting at this point, where everything is usually about what's represented, the representational aspects of it. But Sands is juxtaposing a fine art representational mode in the foreground of his picture with the conventions of decorative art in the background. The Japanese, Chinese, and Egyptian elements are also associated with the decorative art forms of non-European traditions. This doubling of fine and decorative art is reminiscent of the art of the later generations of European symbolists, for example, Odile Rodin or Gustave Klimt. The paintings of Klimt's so-called gold periods juxtapose fully three-dimensional figures with flat gold elements to create a new mode of expression for cl classical subject matter, um, as in his Palace Athene of 1898, which I'm showing now on the right. The helmet and breastplate with its monstrous head of Medusa have an emblematic rather than a representational or a narrative force as attributes of the goddess Athena. And perhaps Sand's gold background can be seen similarly. The gold ground not only represents the golden fleece emblematically, but also becomes the flat decorative background for the whole picture. Sans Medea was often displayed in the great international exhibitions of the later 19th century, so it may have had a direct influence on the next generation of continental artists. But in any case, Sands in Medea and Klimt in his gold period paintings are exploring very similar issues about how to represent antiquity in modern art, how to represent the very oldest of contents in the very newest and most modern kind of style. In both of these cases, the decorative gold elements equate to a movement backwards in history in the terms of 19th century design theory or in the terms of the progressive history of art that's just beginning to be written in these same years. Um, usually in those histories of art, the assumption is that an abstract or a symbolic phase is going to be superseded by a more naturalistic kind of representation later on, but Sands and Clint are working against that logic. So, despite all the historical references, this is the project of a modern artist, an artist who's struggling to come to terms with an overwhelming inheritance from the art of the past, maybe a bit like us art historians. Sands makes sense of things with his ordered movement from modern realism in the foreground through the Venetian Renaissance figure type to the archaic gold background. On the way, he manages to explore quite an unusual range of other points of historical reference, from the despised Caravaggio to the newly trendy Japanese. 
And that white robe um, executed um, with the precision in its um, embroideries of a Van Eyck, um, but it's probably based on an, an African example that's a North African robe that's known to have been circulating in the circle. Some of the elements in the picture still have to be deciphered. Um, the distorted glass beaker, for example, which um, so far has defied everybody's attempts to work out what it is. So, the result of all this looking backwards is a very modern painting, one that could never have been made before the era of public museums, reproductions, and art historical scholarship. Indeed, the press notices of 1869 show that critics still found the archaic gold background of Sand's picture difficult to understand. So one thing that Sand's painting does is that it shows viewers how that gold back might be not just a curiosity, not just something um, in old paintings, but actually something that's aesthetically powerful. His imitation shows why it's not just a primitive picture type, um, from before artists learned to represent landscape backgrounds, but a powerful way of relieving the figure and how its decorative and ornamental character might be not just sumptuous and gorgeous, but actually meaningful. So Sand's painting has something to tell us about the history of art, as well as something to say about the world of modern art of which Sands himself was a part. In the process of studying all the past works that are referenced in the painting, Sands finds his own originality. In a world where gold backs, Japanese dragons, Venetian corporeality, Caravagesque realism, where these are all possible points of reference, there's no question that you might have a single standard of taste, and the field is open for all manner of artistic innovations.